Here we go then. We are bringing Fred in now. Let's get Fred into the room. Into the Zoom room. So Fred, if you're not familiar with Fred, recently we've been doing this series on Jean-Luc Brunel. And it was very timely because what happened was that we saw the arrest of Jean-Luc Brunel. And that is a huge credit to Fred and his fellow activist group um, just pounding the sky, putting all of this information out there about Jean-Luc Brunel and you know, really keeping it at the forefront of the alternative news. So Fred, are you with us? Can you turn on your video button, please? Because it's shown that you've not yet turned on your video button. Okay, coming up now. Here we go, excellent. <laughs> Fred, you are part of our dream team, episode yeah. one. <laughs> I'm amazed. I'm just amazed. You, know, you, you have fantastic guests. What an impressive lineup. And I, I couldn't be prouder to be, to be part of this, uh, this lineup. So prestigious lineup indeed. <laughs> your smile and your accent, just the energy, it just makes me smile. You know, I just love having you on, Fred. It's, and, uh, on top of me, as well as the fantastic work you're doing. <laughs> But your smile and your energy is right up there, always, always smiling and always just, just beaming positivity. So for the people who are not familiar with your work, because this is a new thing that we're doing right now, are you okay just to reintroduce yourself a little bit? Yes, of course, Sean. Uh, basically, I've uh, started last year a channel it's called uh, LFC Connection. Uh, I'm based in France. Uh, and so what I wanted to do with this channel is uh, simply basically starting to point the fingers, have this uh, white collar criminal that has been basically crippling our governments and our countries and basically looking into various areas uh, of interest. And one of them is the pedocriminality. So I wanted to look into basically what was going on in France and uh, Obviously, back in 2019 already, there was the uh, Epstein uh, that, uh, affair, the, the case and the investigation on Epstein that was taking some kind of proportions. And uh, I followed it through. And uh, I thought that uh, there was maybe few people in France that were, that were interesting in the case, but I thought I could do much more and start to really investigate. So I've started this channel and uh, I'm absolutely grateful because we've got some great response and uh, I'm proud to be a part of that community. And my moderators right now are posting a link to your YouTube channel in the live chat. So we would appreciate you supporting Ch Fred's work. And most of Fred's videos when I looked at that channel were in French. So how are we, how are we coming along with getting some uh, subtitles or doing some English speaking videos? Yes, uh, I would say 75% of my videos have a uh, subtitle in English. And uh, it has been uh, a decision we made uh, last December and we announced it that uh, all the video will come out in both languages. So uh, in 2021, uh, people will be able to enjoy videos, not only in French, but also in English. That's going to make it easier for everyone. And more importantly, it's going to just save a lot of time for me because to do proper, obviously, subtitle and sub, it, it, it takes just a, a lot of time, you know. Yeah, so please subscribe to Fred's channel. It's free to subscribe to that channel, to this channel. And, it, you know, it, it helps us, supports the work that we're doing. All right, so what is the latest with JLB, Jean-Luc Brunel? <laughs> well, there's a lot of been, a lot of happened, uh, Sean, uh, since we last talked. And, really? Uh, uh, yes, I mean, it's just, you know, obviously the, in France, we're not in the United States. No, we don't, we're not able to go online and just get information about uh, court cases and so on. So the information is only vehicle and kind of uh, go around via different sources. And you need to have these kind of connections in order to understand what's happening behind the curtain. So I'm happy because today I'm going to provide you with a little bit of update on what happened since Jean-Luc Brunel was arrested. A little bit of a context of this arrest because there's a lot to say about it. And then we've, uh, on the last part, we will evolve obviously uh, the discussions as far as to where we're going with this investigation, where this investigation is going as far as the police concern, and then as far as LFC connections concern, where we're going and where we're taking this investigation. So let me jump right into it, Sean, because I know we have very little time. Uh, 
first of all, let's remember Jean-Luc Brunel is arrested. Is arrested at uh, the uh, Rossi Charles de Gaulle Airport on the 16th of December, and then uh, is arrested by the border police control. So he's presenting his passport. The policeman will tell him basically that he's flagged and is wanted by the French police uh, for questioning. So that's how it all started. Now, we know that Jean-Luc Brunel was uh, trying to get onto a plane on board of Air Senegal to go on Christmas holiday uh, to uh, Dakar, the capital of Senegal. And then I'll tell you a bit more because unfortunately, and maybe fortunately, Senegal was not the last destination. So what happened is that uh, is brought by the OCRVP, just to explain what the OCRVP is, is the uh, basically central office for uh, the prevention of crimes exists against people. So this is basically the agency, the police uh, uh, outfit that is in charge of investigating the Epstein uh, French segments uh, of this case. So that's really interesting because what we're going to see is basically the OCRVP is going to pick up Jean-Luc Brunel at the airport and then they're going to bring him straight uh, into the OCRVP custody. It's going to be put behind bars. Uh, and 48 hours later, on the 18th of December, Jean-Luc Brunel is actually presented in front of a judge, a magistrate, and he will be immediately charged for rape of minors under 15 years old but also uh, charged with sexual harassment. And we're going to look into, uh, into this, uh, of course. And then in addition to, to that, Sean, what happened is that uh, there was all the charges that was brought uh, in the equation, uh, which uh, is referred to as aggravated, aggravated, sorry, charges of human trafficking to the prejudice of underage victims and that is for the purpose of sexual exploitation. So as you can realize, these are serious, serious, obviously, uh, uh, incriminations. Uh, so that's where uh, we are uh, at the moment as far as uh, how it happened. And then uh, they obviously decided to place on luc Prunel uh, under some kind of a lesser charges because they were, they were, they were sorry, they were very worried. Uh, the police was very, very worried about Jean-Luc Brunel exploiting the legal system, finding a loophole whereby he's going to be able to use the status of limitation to list, to simply basically get a, a, a free card out of jail. And for them to avoid this, they basically reduce is custody. So the, the initial custody was four days and then they reduce it to 48 hours, which have allowed obviously the prosecution and the magistrate to charge him with the charges that I've just announced. So, so the, yeah, go on. Oh, go on. Keep going. Keep going. Yeah, I'm, I'm just, I'm going to be unpacking a, 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 li a little bit. What, what I would like to do is maybe just provide the audience just with a clarification, because not everyone have heard about the assisted witness term. It's not something we hear all the time. Now, what is an assisted uh, witness? It's, it's, it's a person that is number one implicated in a criminal case. And it is a status between that of a witness and that of someone that has been accused of a crime. So it's a kind of a bang in the middle if you want. And what it does, it grants Jean-Luc Brunel certain rights in front of his judges, but it also grants the judges right to revert to the initial charges of human trafficking for sexual exploitation purposes. So that's a, basically, I think, a, a way they use to make sure that Jean-Luc Brunel not going to, you know, put up a stunt and then literally try to get out of it. So that's what was done. Now, let's not forget that human trafficking charges are extremely, extremely serious in France, and especially for sexual exploitation. And when we know that he was arrested under these charges, even though they were downscale, we know, and it says clearly, that the police have some serious evidence of, against Jean-Luc Brunel. So that's a very important notion to keep in mind. Now, Jean-Luc Brunel was placed, I would say, on provisional detention. His custody should have, as I said to you, been lasted four days, but it only lasted 40, uh, 40, uh, 48 hours. And then surprise, what happened, uh, uh, Sean, is that 
Jean-Luc Brunel kind of uh, appealed the decision of the judge. So he didn't stay that way and, you know, waiting for the investigation to take his course. What he did, he appealed the decision and told the judge, I don't agree with your statement. I don't agree with the accusation. So what I want to do is to appeal. And the process in France is that it's going to go through a commission, some kind of a committee that's going to, committee of appeal that's going to look into the charges, look into the indictment and obviously ask the police, the investigation to present the charges, the evidence, the information that have obviously triggered the arrest. And then they did that. And this inquiry lasted for about 10 days, all the way up until the 31st of December, when on the 31st of December, basically what happened is the judge came back and then met Brunel. And then that's not going to go down very well with Brunel, because at this stage, Brunel's denied absolutely all the, all the charges. He's absolutely categoric about the fact that he's never armed anybody, and more importantly, that he has ne have nothing to do with Virginia Guffray. Now, the, the judge, the appeal judge is going to get literally, literally virtually annoyed with Jean-Luc Brunel because he spent 10 days looking at all this accusation, all the evidence that was presented to him. And he's got Jean-Luc Brunel telling him, I've done nothing wrong. I've never armed anybody. So the judge got literally, literally virtually annoyed and pissed off and then sent straight back Jean-Luc Brunel behind the bars. That's what happened. So people who've been watching our series on this channel, Fred, with you, are well aware that Jean-Luc Brunel, Epstein was bragging, you know, over a thousand girls were brought over through the pipeline, fast-tracked somehow through, you know, the feds because of their connections, and also that girls procured from Eastern Europe from poor backgrounds ended up in this situation let's just say i'm euphemizing here um in the on the island whereby you know participants included prince andrew maxwell and epstein according to the, the testimony of at least one uh, survivor uh, virginia and i think others are corroborating so the triplet story as well that came out uh, epstein boasted you know that he slept, slept with these 12 year old triplets from jean luc brunel and now this guy is saying that he hasn't done anything wrong. So <laughs> is he saying that because perhaps he thinks he does have some power left through his connections? Because if people have missed the entire series we've done on this channel, I mean, Fred meticulously detailed Jean-Luc Brunel's rise in the modeling industry and the level of connections he made during his ascension, the political class, we got um, the Prince Andrew factor. Mm -hmm. Very powerful people could be compromised. Do you think that those people, those connections, he's trying to bring them now to save him from this situation? Well, I, I, I would say that Jean-Luc Brunel will use absolutely every single bullet that he has to, uh, to fight this because right now the only position that he can have is to deny the charges and basically to contest the charges that are uh, hold against him. So what he's going to use is connection. Yes, absolutely. I mean, anything that is possible, but there is a course of justice that is taking place there. So the options are limited because there is a framework, a judicial framework that's going to basically uh, push his lawyers to, uh, to have a strategy and he's going to have to follow that strategy. Jean-Luc Brunel is not a lawyer, so he's lawyers. And by the way, he's got new lawyers. I'll just put that in the middle. But uh, Corinne Dreyfus-Smith, as you know, was the longtime uh, lawyer for Jean-Luc Brunel. And it seems that after his arrest, she's uh, decided to basically drop him. And she dropped him and she's decided not to represent Jean-Luc Brunel any longer. So what we saw is basically a new team of lawyers that's going to come to the rescue and represent Jean-Luc Brunel. You know, so these are the people that now are in charge. There's mainly one lady, it's called Marianne Abigail. And then she's also working and she's assisted by another lawyer it's called Matthias Shishproshish. So these two uh, lawyers will be representing uh, Brunel during the course of the investigation, because let's not forget, this is still an ongoing investigation, even so Jean-Luc Brunel is behind a bar. Uh, so to answer your question is that 
I would like to add something perhaps that's going to help people to better understand, but we are talking about uh, human trafficking and sex trafficking, which means we are talking about a network here. We're talking about a network of people that know each other. Sometimes they don't, but they work together and everyone has a role to play. So it's not a plane where everybody is on the same level. It just doesn't work that way. There's no democracy in this system. It's very hierarchical. And more importantly, if some people are taking orders and some people are above you and you're going to have to respect the orders. And I think that Jean-Luc Brunel is definitely not at the, at the top of that ladder. I think that is working for some people, amongst which Ghislaine Maxwell and at the time Jeffrey Epstein or Jeffrey Epstein, and he was basically playing a role in this uh, in this instance in this organization. And we're going to see a little bit further down in this discussion uh, what was the role that he was playing. What I'd like to do just is to finish basically just the uh, the last aspect of the charges and uh, what Jean-Luc Brunel is suspected uh, by the prosecution of. And we have had a confirmation by Remy Heiss, which happened to be the prosecutor of Paris. And what he says in this last statement, he said that Jean-Luc Brunel was actually suspected of having organized the transport and the accommodation of young girls for the benefit of Jeffrey Epstein. And that's give us a very good clue because you remember from day one, when we first started to talk to you and I, we always mentioned to you that the logistics and the monies are the two keys in order to understand how big this network is, how vast, and really right now what we're all looking for, and I've seen the UVSI, the United States Virgin Islands authorities and prosecutors going after these logs, these flight logs, trying to understand how big it was, how, many, how frequent, and what was the destinations where Jean-Luc Brunel, Epstein, Maxwell, and all the other names, and you know the list is pretty long, where these guys were going, how long, how frequently, where were they going? And then we need to place them on that timeline, on that timeline, sorry, at a certain place. And that's gonna help tremendously this, uh, this, uh, this investigation. So very important uh, note from the prosecutor. Now, uh, what I would like to say is that uh, actually this morning, <laughs> funny enough, I was uh, chatting with Ticia Usman, uh, we, most of the people that are here today probably know Tisha Husman. She's uh, uh, the model that has been very proactive in denouncing Jean-Luc Brunel and his activities back in the late 80s and early 90s when he was already a predator and he was abusing, drugging young models, promising them great careers and so on. We all know the story. What's important here is that this morning I was actually chatting with her and uh, she informed me that Jean-Luc Brunel actually started his first stunt. And the first stunt that he pulled is was ac actually asking the prosecution to be liberated, to be basically taken out of jail. And he was offering the prosecution basically to wear an, what I call an ankle monitor. I believe this is how we call it, ankle monitor or uh, an electronic anklet that will uh, allow basically the police to know about his where about at all times. So that's exactly what happened. He's been asking the prosecution to let him out and then provided some kind of what you guys call in the United States, maybe in the UK as well, kind of a bail condition whereby he'll be able to stay on the sort of a house of arrest with a uh, ankle monitor. And that's what he offered. Now, that was uh, about eight hours ago, probably, or even more. And then uh, about two, three hours ago, I had the chance to speak again with Ticia. And then we have now the confirmation from directly from inside that uh, this was not basically taken seriously at all. And more importantly, the reason why it's not going to happen is because such request is not, uh, doesn't depend on the judge, on the judge's will. It depends on the police. The police is in charge of the custody and the process of the custody. And therefore, it is up to the police to decide if Jean-Luc Brunel is fit for basically being placed on house of arrest with an, uh, an ankle monitor. Uh, Jean-Luc Brunel got arrested with a single ticket, a one-way ticket at the airport of Russie Charles de Gaulle. Definitely is a flight risk and definitely he has the mean and the network to disappear and they won't let that happen. So that's an excellent news, obviously, we've heard about two hours ago. Wow, so there you have it. We have just brought this up to date to within two hours of it happening. Two hours. <laughs> <laughs>
it's uh, th there's no time for people like us. You know, we we, we deal with the news. We are trying to make sure we confirm it, and uh, this coming directly from a, you know, from a deep inside. Say, there's no doubt about the information that I provided here. And Ticia has allowed me to to provide you with this information. So thanks to her, because even though she's a bit far away from the case, she's still very much involved as far as the discussions. She's been a very proactive person in this. Uh, uh, in this case, and uh, we we owe a lot to her. You know, she's inspired a lot of people. All right. Now, my next my next question um, is: When these wealthy, powerful, elite deviants get busted, they fight wars on multiple fronts. So there's the war in the courtroom is one. There's the war in the media is another. So for example, you got this free Maxwell campaign, putting news stories out saying that she loves puppies and she wants to save the oceans. And the, <laughs> you know, the complete antithesis of a procurer and trafficker. You've got Prince Andrew saying that he's a victim of greedy US prosecutors, hungry to make stories of his famous royal name. And he's actually just a victim. He's a victim in all this. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. you know, us in the English speaking world are, are mostly aware of this, but we cannot see most of us on this channel what is happening in the French speaking world. Has Jean Luc Brunel, you know, tapped into his media contacts to try and portray a version of him being, you know, Saint Jean Luc? <laughs> well, uh, the good news is I, I must say that the uh, the, the French uh, MSM, you know, the uh, the mainstream media has barely made any mention of it. They've probably decided in uh, in concert to not cover the Jean Luc Brunel affair. It's not even considered as a big business today in France. The big channels, the, the the usual suspects, are not interested at all. They just kind of underplay the importance of this case. So we are not seeing any positions as like media will start to give Jean Luc Brunel excuses and saying that you know we've been a little bit too tough on the, on the guy and this is unfair. Like, none of that. All the press has done is report his arrest, couple of information, the AFP, couple of, you know, big players in the MSM has been kind of coming forward with articles, but they all pretty much like usual in concert. They're not being creative. They're not being really digging into like, you know, we are doing as, a, you know, as the investigative uh, and independent investigative journalists, because we want the crunchy stuff. We really want to understand where these guys is coming from. And more importantly, we want to know how big this uh, sex trafficking ring, even if it's been denied and even so it has been still alleged at this moment in time, you know, we have, a lot of information already as from an independent investigative point of view. So I can only imagine how much the police, how much even the media and how much the intelligence services have on Jean-Luc Brunel and, and the cohort, obviously. In our last chat, we speculated about the French authorities reaching out to Prince Andrew now, just like the US authorities have reached out to Prince Andrew. Has anything come about in that area? Well, there's a desire. It's been kind of a brought uh, kind of to the surface as the possibility. So nothing has kind of a, uh, escalated. No, nothing has been uh, uh, activated as far as the prosecution. And if they have, I trust will be really probably, you know, only few people will be aware of that. But because we're talking about royalties and we are talking about in France, although we are still a, a democracy and a republic, but we still have a huge amount of royals at a very powerful place within not only our government, but, you know, in uh, the government that you don't get to see the shadow government of our country. So we have to be extremely careful. This is where things are getting dangerous for people like myself and other investigators. We know that as soon as you talk about royalties, you talk about, you know, aristocracy at the highest level and the contact and the links they might have 
with France and England, then this has become really, really hot. So we have to be very precise. We have to be cautious in what we're saying. And I think even the government and the police and the investigator themselves are very cautious about releasing any information uh, at that. But uh, I will cover some angles about that that you might, you might find very interesting. I'm sure the audience will find that interesting too. Any rumors about potential French co-conspirators that could end up indicted? Okay, so the interesting thing uh, about Jean-Luc Brunel is Jean-Luc Brunel was uh, is someone that is extremely compartmentalized. You've learned that from someone. I have a little idea about who actually taught him how to be compartmentalized, not only in his behavior, but also in his activities. So Jean-Luc Brunel has different circles in which he evolves. Uh, in Paris, obviously, the fashion world was his uh, circle. He has his close friends. Jean-Luc Brunel come from a very rich family. I've actually realized how wealthy his parents were, much more wealthy than we thought. And more importantly, that he has these close friends from you know, this French aristocracy, these high net worth uh, families that have kids that know each other, that goes out together, and they grew up together, and they kept in touch. And that has formed a close circle, amongst which you have people people like Jean-Luc Le Feur, Varsano, and other names like Arnaud Brunel, his own brother. And I'm going to put a real and uh, emphasize on Arnaud Brunel because he's been absolutely quiet from day one. And I found that absolutely amazing because he's been with Jean-Luc for a long period of time. And when Jean-Luc Brunel left Karin's models back in Paris and then went to the United States to uh, basically get himself and his brother into a venture with Next Model, with Kate Fates. Arnaud Brunel was already there and he was already in Karen Model. So he's always been close to Jean-Luc and he's been putting his own money into this venture. So he's been with Next Corporation Management, which was an outfit that was created to avoid the name of Brunel to become you know, too shiny because his reputation was already tarnished. So they use this outfit as a kind of a, you know, shell company. People will know Next Management Corporation, but they will not know nothing about the Brunels. But in America, people refer not as Jean-Luc Brunel. They always refer to them as the Brunels. Now, you get investments from Arno that is coming into Next Management Corporation. Then after, they obviously on the side decide to open current models of America. That's another company where Arnaud Brunel is going to get involved. And then finally and eventually Arnaud Brunel will be the financier also. He's going to put some on it toward MC squared. He's the one that was paying the bills. There was no money in MC squared. In Miami, there was no money anywhere. This was a shell. This was a vehicle and that was not profitable. And one of the questions that we all need to ask ourselves is why Arnaud Brunel was keep on putting so much money in a business that is just simply not profitable. We have so many testimonies, so many affidavits and deposition that shows clearly that this business was not profitable. So the questions that we all ask ourselves is, what is just maintaining MC Squared, Talent Miami, for instance, just on a life support to keep this kind of shell, to keep this front of the house shop in order to allow the business in the background to thrive and just use it as a vehicle. So this is a lot of questions we've been asking ourselves and I'm sure the investigators are asking themselves these questions. Follow the money and we're gonna understand the role Arno Brunel has played in this venture, but also perhaps in this operation. So this is an open debate, we're looking into it. And uh, I can give you a little bit more information if the time uh, allows, but, uh, what I can tell you is Arnaud Brunel is married to literally royalty or aristocracy in France. So from a very wealthy family, Arnaud Brunel has managed to basically marry into aristocracy. He's married to a lady called Nathalie Gillette. She's known obviously as Nathalie Brunel now. They have four kids. They have three daughters and one son. Uh, I think they have Milania, they have Isabelle, and they have... Uh, uh, Colomb, these are the three daughters. 
uh, of Brunel. And then the uh, fourth one is a son and his name is Eamon. Eamon is actually an interesting character because he's a son that is extremely well integrated in the uh, French aristocracy. And we're talking at the highest level here. And we know also that Arnaud Brunel and Nathalie Gillette Brunel have inherited of a castle, a castle of, um, Ooh, I have the name, I don't want to say anything, but uh, it's a pretty beautiful castle and people that are going to go on my videos on my channel, they'll be able to see it. What I'm trying to say here is that we have basically uh, the kind of mingling in between two communities, you know, communities of very high net worth, family, industrial, rich people, and then on the other side, you have pure French aristocracy. And the point that link these two communities is the domain of Chantilly. The domain of Chantilly, it's basically an NGO that was created back in the days, quite a long time ago, actually, in New York. And this NGO basically promotes uh, anything that has to do with the preservation and the taking care of the domain of Chantilly, the castle, obviously the magnificent landscapes. They're gonna be obviously taking care of the art. They have a massive uh, art collections. And more importantly, they are extremely passionate about horse racing. The equestrial aspect of uh, this NGO and this network should not be undermined. It is almost a point of rendezvous, a point whereby the royalty from Europe, the aristocracy of Europe is meeting. Le Prix de Diane, which is one of, you know, you could compare it to the Ascot in the, in the UK or simply to Cheltenham, you know, for the uh, uh, Queen's Mother's Day races. Well, there are races like this in France and even the royals from the UK are coming to France to participate in these races. And I've heard so many stories about what's going on during yeah, these races. We have to pause you here. Today. We have to pause you here. Um, Fred, we've gone five minutes over time. Um, huge thank you for being in the Dream Team, Atwood Unleashed, episode one, spending time with us this evening. Like I said in the beginning, just that smile, it's so infectious. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 30 minutes, Sean, and it's just so short. Uh, well, I'm uh, sure... You know, we, people... like to, we like to talk, you know? <laughs> people in the, in the live chat, put a one. If you'd like to see Fred coming back onto the show, uh, we would appreciate your feedback. I'm sure they're going to be all over that. So, yeah, in the description box are going to be all links to your channel and everything else. So please go down, support Fred and his work. You know, Jean-Luc Brunel is where he belongs. He's behind bars. And Fred is keeping us up to date within two hours of two the hours. latest news <laughs> pertaining to Epstein's chief procurer after Maxwell, Jean-Luc Brunel. So there you have it. Thanks, Fred. And we're now going to move on to Charlie Robinson. Thank you. Bye-bye. Cheers. Thank you to everyone. Yeah, thank you very much. Good to you. Right. Let's... Um... Get Charlie in. Here we go.